Hello, I'm Donald McCauley and welcome to MedicsVoices.com, where we talk to the key opinion leaders in health and medicine around the world. Today we're in Dublin and I'm talking to Austin O'Carroll. Now, how do you describe Austin? He's a family doctor, a social entrepreneur, international sailor, teacher, cyclist, radical activist. But actually, Austin, you very nearly didn't become a doctor. Tell us about that. So, um, just my background is I, I was born with a disability. I have thalidomide. Uh, my mother, interestingly, she, anyone who doesn't know, she only took one tablet. Um, but on, one tablet was enough to cause a significant amount of destruction. Now, anyway, so I have a disability. And uh, I spent a lot of my time in, in hospital in, as a child. And um, to my disability affects my legs for walking and also um, my thumb. I have only a, a very rudimentary thumb. So um, that affects my ability to use my hands. So I decided I wanted to do medicine early on. And um, in fact, what I did was I basically went to my own surgeon and got advice from several doctors. And they all advised me that I wouldn't be able to do medicine because firstly, they said there's a lot of walking involved in terms of going to um, uh, a lot of walking involved around hospital. But then more importantly, they said they felt because of my hands, I wouldn't be able to take bloods or to do what in IVs. So I took it on the chin at the time. And I decided to go to do law instead. And um, in fact, I went to Trinity College in my first year in college. Um, I had the privilege of having Mary Robinson as my tutor. And in the second year, uh, she left and I was transferred to Mary McAleese as my tutor. Well, both of them subsequently became presidents of Ireland. Mary Robinson became president of Ireland. And then she became the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. And she's the lead, the lead for the Council of the Elderly, the, the International Council of the Elderly. She's a well-recognised international player. And Mary McAleese is this wonderful woman who went on to become president of Ireland. And uh, what actually happened to me is that I was doing law and I fancy this girl who's doing medicine in a different college. And uh, um, we went travelling on our summer holidays. And as you do, you often end up together as a group. You know, you all go around and then you come together. And I happened to end up in the same group that this girl I fancied in, strangely enough. And it was in southern Italy, uh, down below the coast of Sorrento. I was I remember one very romantic evening sitting outside with her, overlooking the Mediterranean Sea as the sun set on the edge of a cliff. And uh, unfortunately, nothing romantic happened, except she said she thought it was ridiculous that I didn't do medicine. So I went, got on a train the next day, went straight back to Dublin, went to Mary McAleese. And a week later, I was standing in front of a group of men in a room showing them my hands and legs. And two days later, I was in medicine. During your medical school time, you really became very socially active. You, you were involved in a lot of organisations. Yeah, I sort of, the, the two years I did law, actually, that's where I got involved in it. I, I always say I had two educations in, in college, one inside the walls of Trinity. Uh, Trinity is based on, uh, it's, it's, it's built with these walls around it. And it's based on the concept of an island of learning, a haven of learning within the, the toil and, and, and muck of the city. And uh, so outside Trinity is one of the poorest areas in Dublin. Um, and... Uh, and uh, I got very involved with youth work. Summers, I ended up working in playgrounds um, in the inner city. And during the year, I would bring kids out. Got involved in also visiting old folk um, in their homes, doing, um, we used to do tutorials with people, local kids, visited work with people with disabilities and organisations as well. So I got very involved in that type of work. And I suppose that education was as important as my medical education, because in a way that set the template for where I was going to go for the rest of my career. So fast track on a little bit. So you, the rest of your career is spent in inner city Dublin. Yeah, well, there's a little interim in between, which is an interesting one, because in a way, when I was working in, in Trinity and working with the Vincent de Paul, a fantastic organisation, it's a charity. And I learned sort of a charitable approach. Now, we we were, it was an interesting group because we, we did do things like we tried to bring people, we brought people with disabilities in to show how inaccessible Trinity College was. We also ran an open day for the local community because they never like it was really interesting. The local community ought to walk all around Trinity, but they never go into the walls, even though it's free access for everyone. And then in the 90s, I got involved with disability activism. And I went in with a slightly um, pompous attitude, thinking that, oh, listen, I'm a successful person with disability. I've got plenty to teach. In fact, I did more learning, much more learning than teaching. Because uh, I learned about the reality of what it was to be a person with a disability, but I also learned about a totally different approach, which was the rights-based approach and uh, the complexity of a rights-based approach. And um, 
while I've great respect for people in charities, I've I founded two charities, I still work in them, and I've great respect for people who, who come from that perspective. Ultimately, a charitable approach is about keeping people in the same position. It's not about liberation or getting people out of that position. So you go and you help them survive, but in a way you're you're not changing the system, you're just helping people survive within the present system. A rights-based approach is about changing the system. And that probably defined my approach to healthcare so, you know, from then on. And then in 1997, I got was managed to get a GP practice in the inner city. And just to give you a, 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 a flavor of what it was like when I first started in the inner city, I, I was like shock therapy. Um, I had ne never realized how the effect of the drugs plague that had affected inner city Dublin from the 80s. Um, I ended up meeting families who'd lost three or four kids to, to drugs. In my first four years, I was attending a funeral at least once a month of a young person. Um, I faced um, aggression on a daily basis uh, for people looking for drugs. And um, uh, in fact, it was ironic. Like it was so um, it was so intense, the aggression, that I found myself after six months for taking that at the weekends, I'd have to take Valium to, to, to relax down again because I'd be so stressed out by it. You dealt very much with people on the margins of healthcare, you know, people that other doctors shy away from, run away from. But you tried to bring this mainstream and you've brought on a whole generation of people who are involved in healthcare on the margins. Tell, tell us about that work. So I think that came from originally that, as I said, I came from a rights-based approach. When I first started the practice, I decided that we would take a, a vision that that vision meant that we wanted everyone to have equal access to healthcare and we'd have a practice mission. It was just me and one receptionist. So what we did was we actually, um, the mission was that we would uh, provide healthcare to everyone irrespective of background. And as part of that, we decided that we would try and not bar people. So as I said to you, all those people who were coming in and, 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 and dealing with, you know, who were quite aggressive, we actually managed to get them off benzos um, without losing them as patients. So from the early on, we had this idea of trying to manage. And, you know, I've since learned the whole theory of adverse childhood events and, child, and trauma-informed care. And in a way, that's what we were trying to do, is not to, to lose the people who we felt were most disenfranchised, because the people who you borrow from practice are the ones who are most likely to end up dead or young and have significant health care. And I suppose... Then what happened was I got a reputation for working in that area. And then they were setting up clinics for initially for migrants. And I got involved in providing clinics for migrants. And then I got involved in setting up clinics for homeless people. They, they needed a clinic for homeless people set up in inner city Dublin. And basically, um, I started one in city centre Dublin. And God, we've around 40 or so now around Dublin and around others in Cork, Limerick and Galway since. So it was the start of a... You know, basically what happened was we started one clinic, then they asked us for a second clinic and a third clinic. And um, then I realized that with all these different clinics providing services to homeless people, but they were not connected. So a homeless person could walk into my clinic one day and ask for certain drugs, go into another doctor the next day and get either the same drugs or different drugs that would interfere. So the first thing we did, we set up a common database so that we could all see that, you know, if a patient goes into one clinic, this is what they get. And then when they come to my clinic, I'm able to be able to prescribe consistently with that. And also then allowed us to do long-term care. So then I said, once we got that, we also decided we set up an organization to try and bring common protocols and procedures. So we set up safety net and that united all these clinics. And then, as I said, once we had safety net, then safety net was able to develop services where we felt there was gaps. So for example, we developed all these drop-in services and we brought these services to hostels where homeless people were. And then we realized that there was no service for rough sleepers. So then we found a mobile health unit for rough sleepers. Then we saw that there was a lot of infectious diseases and we knew we met these colleagues in the UK who were doing TB screening and bloodborne virus screening. So we brought them over once a year. And then we realized that there was a, a lot of homeless people who were addicted to drugs and not um, couldn't access care. So we developed a, um, a um, opiate substitution treatment and that has expanded to provide in benzodiazepine treatment and stabilization treatment, sorry, and, and um, benzodiazepine treatment and alcohol community detoxes. We also have now two uh, stabilization centers. We then developed a, um, a model for a step up, step down center, intermediate care center, and that's been developed. 
And then other things happened where people sort of said, oh, listen, we have a lot of Roma here. And because our services started to take Roma and we were using translators, we then had an expertise and provided service to Roma. So then we provided a clinic for Roma. And then we saw there was a lot of non-documented migrants who couldn't access healthcare. So then we provided that. So everything just mushroomed. And uh, now we have this quite extensive network for marginalized people in Dublin in, in Dublin and Ireland here. Yeah. Now let me bring it back to the homeless people, because yeah. one of my favorite quotations is when you say, who ever thought it was a good idea to post out appointments to yes. homeless people? So tell me, now you developed this, but it's not just developing the work, because you did a PhD as well. Tell us about your PhD. Well, when I was developing these programs, um, I felt, I, I started finding, you know, I, I learned that you, when you're developing proposals, it, you need to come from an evidence base. And I felt that it would really augment my ability to develop proposals and develop services if I had this academic background. And then the second thing was I also um, enjoyed research. I, I'm one of these people who thought I was terrible at research at college, but then I discovered that it, it was all about finding what you want to research. And when I found out something I wanted to research, actually, I found this really interesting. I got involved in research. And then secondly, I found I'm more naturally a qualitative researcher than a quantitative researcher. So I chose the area of exploring why homeless people don't use health services. And that was really relevant to uh, my work. And it's really interesting because when you do a PhD, you become an, a, really, a world expert in a very tight area, small area. But that's really, really obviously because it was so central to what I did it not only because a lot of it guided my work subsequently and I'll go through the the, the findings of the, the things so the, how the findings guided my work but also it gave me the ability to write good proposals when I was looking for further funding for other services and also you get the reputation as being an expert in the area so on several fronts it's so well worth doing I did an ethnographic exploration of why homeless people don't use health services. Oh, I'd sit out in the streets with rough sleepers. I'd sit in drop-in centres. I'd sit in food holes. And what I found was that, see, homeless people don't use health services the way uh, everyone does. They they wait till they're, like, they'll, I'll see if someone last week who'll have a groin abscess and it needs uh, to be incised. And I'd say, you need to go to hospital. And they'd say, oh, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Just give me some antibiotics. I'll be fine. So they'll wait till they're absolutely really, uh, you know, almost out on their legs before they go into the hospital. Um, secondly, they'll often, they they default from treatment. They leave hospital before they've completed treatment. They leave the waiting room in ED before they're seen. They don't keep hospital appointments. And I'll come back to that. Um, and then thirdly, um, they don't attend GP at all. They, they avoid general practice. They tend to be high users of emergency department as a result, and they tend to avoid psychiatric services. So I wanted to understand why, when you, when you consider they're, like, they're the sickest population you can think of. Like in, we know their, their mortality rates are far higher. We know in Dublin, for example, one in 20 of HIV, one in 20 of Hep B, one in five, uh, three of Hep C, and they have very high rates of COPD, diabetes, everything you can, the normal illnesses that are in the community, they have higher rates than everyone else. Uh, mental health, one in two is depression, one in two out of five have um, anxiety. And to show you the level of that, we know in depression that one in five in Dublin have attempted suicide at some stage, and one in three have attempted suicide at some stage in their lives, and one in five in the last six months. So really sick population, they don't use health services, why not? So the things I found was what I called, I, I divided between external uh, barriers and internalized barriers and external barriers there was four different types there was physical barriers and the obvious barrier was distance you may have access to a gp but if your gp is five miles away and you don't have bus fare you can't get to it um, and if you may have a gp down the country but it's way too far to get to but then administrative barriers and uh um, obviously, I was saying the obvious one is appointments. I, I'm thinking of writing an, ar an article called Four Most Stupid Things in Medicine. And the most stupid thing in medicine is going to be sending out appointments to ho homeless people. Uh, because, one, they don't get the letters. Two is, even if they get the letters, their lives are chaotic. They don't have regular lifestyles. They don't have diaries. They don't have a regular routine to their day. They don't have access to buses, to cars, to get to their appointments. Um, so it just doesn't work. 
The third dimension of barriers is forms. I always say, if you want a homeless person not to use your service, get them to fill a form. And if you really don't want them to use it, make that form as complex as possible. And to access free health primary care in Ireland, you have to go through a really complex form. So it's not surprising that 40% um, of homeless people have never filled out this form. Um, a third barrier was, um, administrative barrier was having to have strict rules. And I understand having to have rules for safety, the problem is when you apply strict rules strictly to a population where rules were enforced with stick and fist when they were kids, um, they're going to react the way they've learned as kids to shouting, you know, aggression, etc. So it's going to be no surprise that they're, they're kicked out of your service or they're excluded. So third one was stigma. Stigma was, a, was probably the biggest barrier. Um, then the internalized barriers, they're barriers where you internalize external things. So obviously, if you internalize stigma, it means you think I'm not going to be treated if I go to that service, so I won't go to the service. Um, some people internalize the, the idea that they're, they're going to die young. So what's the point in taking care of their health? Uh, that's called a fatalistic cognition, I call it. And why do you think you're going to die young? Because you see lots of young people dying and lots of people do die in homelessness. If you, some people you have a denial cognition saying, I'm going to be fine. And I think that comes from the idea that in homelessness, to survive homelessness, you need to be in denial because if you were to literally absorb the fact that you've been so abandoned by your family and society, it would overwhelm you. So a good way to survive homelessness is denial, but it's not a good way to manage your health. So all of these things, basically I concluded that we develop a health service that's designed for middle class people who have routines in their lives, who have uh, are able to keep appointments, who are able to assert themselves in middle class ways that won't get them kicked out, and who value their health and who have hope of a future that they are looking forward to. So therefore, that service is, we designed that service for them because we know they will use our service. But that service isn't designed for homeless people. So that work and that PhD transformed the way I understand our services and the way we were developing our services and helped guide the directions for a lot of them. So you've talked about so many different other people and how you've cared for so many other people, but I'd like to ask you about how you care for yourself. Uh, I mean, obviously I, I, I do work intensively, but I also when I'm finished, I've always been able to go that I finish, say, at six o'clock, I'm finished. And I, I, would, I would take time off and I'm, I'm good at separating out. So that's the first thing. But then I um, I go, um, go cycling a lot. There's two parts to that. One is it's self-care in terms of I just love it. And two, it's very good for your mental health. But three, I mean, because of my disability, I thought I actually around 10 years, I thought I was going to be in a wheelchair by now. Because my walking had got down and reduced from three miles when I was 21 to literally 50 yards. And I'd have to stop even in that 50 yards uh, because of pain in my legs. So I lost 20 kg weight over a year. And then I just became intensively exercised. So I started to cycle a lot. Then the other one I started doing was great was uh, uh, silent discos. Because, um, you know, I needed to do impact to prevent osteoporosis. And someone said, oh, dancing's great for impact. So I go down... Um, Twice a week, I go down with my uh, cycling tights on and I don't wear a top. And I tell my kids, don't bring your friends in because you'll be embarrassed. <laughs> and I put on my uh, earphones and I do 40 minutes silent disco. And I actually now could walk up to 3K. Um, and it's so, it's hugely transformed. But then, so I do all that. I love that. I mean, I go out and socialize. Um, so I, yeah, all those things are self-care. And then you're talking about the sailing. Um, I had I just had this total opportunity where I, I was asked once to go. I used to sail a lot. I, and I, years ago, I used to race a lot, but I got away from it. And they were a disabled sailing uh, competition in Ireland, and they were short a sailor, and I ended up going on it. And then I and ended up someone saying, oh, listen, we're looking for someone to do the Paralympics. Will you do join us in the Paralympics? So I ended up doing Rio 2016 in the Paralympic sailing, which was an amazing experience, yeah. So... I've been okay at taking care of myself. Don't worry. <laughs> Life awesome. is good and I enjoy it. Awesome. You're a star, an Olympian, a family doctor, a role model for all of us. But actually, I thought we were going to have an exclusive interview this morning. But you cheated on me. Because for our listeners to hear that 
Austin O'Carroll was on primetime national television on Saturday night. <laughs> Austin O'Carroll, it's been a fantastic pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much indeed, as always. John, it's a total pleasure talking to you. So I'm delighted to see you again.